we got 602 i think we'll get started um thank you everyone for joining steve thank you for joining us and coming on to chat about the book um a couple just housekeeping type things one thing keep an eye out on the chat and the q a function questions make sure to put them in there but also the folks in meat eater throwing a discount on some of their books and their gear that link and that promo code will be in there if you use code outdoor kids at the meat eater.com you get 20 percent off books and meat eater apparel we'll make sure to email this to you guys it'll also be in that chat function but make sure to take a look at that and check the website out after um but yeah jumping in right away i, I don't need much introduction for this gentleman steve came on you know he just released his book a couple of weeks ago and we wanted to just kind of get him to talk about you know trials tribulations what he learned throughout this process and then obviously give everyone on here an opportunity to ask some questions about raising outdoor kids in an inside world. So Steve, thank you for jumping on and looking forward to hearing more about the book. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, I'll set up the, before we get into the question, I'm going to set up a little bit of the genesis of the book. In the book writing literary business, um, authors typically have what's called an agent. And, uh, you know, agent like agents like so much stuff in show business and things. Agents work on just a percentage of what they sell books for, right? So I've had the same agent since I became a writer. I've had the same agent for well over twenty years or twenty years or so. Um, when my wife got pregnant with our first kid, who just turned twelve, okay, so twelve years and nine months ago, my agent, this guy named Mark Gerald. Uh, He's like, man, you got to someday write a book about what it's like trying to like replicate the upbringing you had in the outdoors with a kid. Like, I don't know like, how are you going to manage that? What are your expectations about it? And I, I don't want to say I wrote him off about it. I mean, I definitely listened to him, but I just knew that I wasn't. I wasn't there yet. You know, the kid wasn't even I mean, like, I, honestly, the kid was probably not even born when I happened, you know, yeah. Um, and then I thought about it, man. I, when, even when he was, when my oldest boy was five, I now have three kids, um, seven, nine, and 12. When my oldest boy was five or six, I even thought about doing it. But it felt a little like I didn't really know enough what I was talking about. Um, it must have been the time he was nine or 10, I started working on this book. And at that point, I was raising three kids. I knew a lot of the trials and tribulations of trying to get kids outside. Just set up a little bit like kind of the one of the primary motivations in exploring this idea is I was brought up in a, in a rural area. I was raised on a, a small lake. We had tons of woods around us. This is pre on X days. We had no idea who owned it. Um, we regarded it all as public. It turns out it was not, um, but we just roamed around, dude. Like we roamed around and hunted and took our canoes and trapped and just, we just messed around outside and, and, uh the way it was enforced in our family was i mean i'm like simplifying it a little bit but not really like if if my old man caught if he caught you inside right especially if you're doing something stupid like you're like watching tv during daylight hours yeah he's gonna make you do chores and so like that and other reasons i don't know we we're just outside a lot and, and identified as an outdoor family identified as hunters and anglers um and it was so easy. And, and looking back on it, I always wondered, like, was it effortless for my parents to do that? Was it just, was it, was it expedient? Like it was easier than having us in the house because we were annoying. And so me and my siblings were out of the house. Were they aware of the risks and just didn't care? We did stuff now that you would, we did stuff that uh, people would call child protective services on you now. So <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. did they, you know, like what was my mom's comprehension of that, you know? Was it that, was it, this is really dangerous, but I'm going to let them do it anyways, because I want to foster in them self-sufficiency, resilience, right? Toughness. Um, or did she not even think about the risk? Like the risk didn't matter to her. She didn't view kids that way. They, they were more expendable. You know, I don't, I don't really know the answer to it. Yeah. Once I had kids my own, man, I, I really pondered about it um, for various reasons. My first two kids were born in New York. My third kid was born in Seattle. Um it wasn't going to come easy. Like for them to be engaged and have a relationship with nature and the natural world was not going to be as easy as what I had. And I find 
again and again and again, I hear that from parents. I hear it from parents all the time. And I'm of the age now where like a lot of my friends are young parents. I hear it again and again. There's all these things we do to like, there's always ways in which you be, you expect it. You're, you're doing better for your kids than was done for you. Okay. It might be that I'm like, you know, my kids will have better access to education, whatever. You know I mean? Like we go to the, we take them to the doctor a hell of a lot more than I went to the doctor, whatever you're, you're providing all these better things. But I was like, man, that's one area where I'm failing. Yeah. Or thought I was. And so I really became very deliberate about like, like creating time to be outdoors and I did it and it was for a couple of reasons. One was that's where I want to be. Right. So it's selfish. And two, I have reason to believe I have, I can't prove it empirically. I have strong reason to believe that there's a ton of, it does a ton of benefits to kids. I mean, we know this kind of instinctively. We also know it empirically. We have a lot of proof about the health benefits of being outside. Uh, and it's also a changing world, man. People have different ideas about firearms. Now people have different ideas about hunting now when i was a kid um there's a there's a quote from a friend of mine pat dirk and he's talking about wisconsin which was across the lake from us but he said of his area in wisconsin he says if you're not a deer hunter you sleep with one and that would have been true where i grew up but that's not true in a lot of places now so for all these reasons i spent a lot of time thinking about kids and, and my own experiences with kids and got to where i felt that i was a subject matter expert on kids in the outdoors not that I'm the best dad, I'm not, not that I'm the best husband, I'm not, but I knew as much or more as anybody about what it takes to get kids outside and what happens when you do get them outside. And that's when I wrote, that's when I wrote the book or when I could look people in the eye and say that I wrote this book, right? Without someone yeah. thinking like, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I got to, I got to that spot. And with my other books, I've always tried to get to that spot, you know, before I wrote. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, you know, you talk about this, this has been something that's been in the works for 10 plus years. Mm -hmm. I could go about like consolidating all that information and just kind of like, was there any research that you did, but just getting your thoughts, I'm sure there was different points. That yeah. you're like, oh, that's a great point, whatever. Like, what did that process look like putting this together over years? When I started writing books and even magazine articles when I was younger, I would, my writing method was to have really, I'd start, I had no idea what I was going to do. I'd kind of write the end for some weird reason. And then I'd be like, well, if I can write something good enough to substantiate the end, that'd be all right. And then I would write all the easy parts. Then I'd like kind of write the hard parts. It was just, it was, I was all over the place. Uh, with this one, I knew that I, I, I just broke it out into disciplines. I, I broke it out. Well, I, I broke it out into, I start with this idea about the importance of, of, of trying to like train your kids not to look down at nature and not to look up at it too much, right? To try to look like, to try to, and you can't tell, you don't tell them this. It's too abstract. It's just something yeah. you know in your head, but you can, you keep it in mind. Like I don't explain to my kids, I don't want them to look up or down at nature. Yeah. I demonstrate it, right? But I don't want them yeah. to look up. Like I, I don't want them to view it that way. Um, and I write about that in the beginning. And I write about just some general things to set the book up. And then I get like really into disciplines, camping, um, gardening, foraging, right? At, in the home, at home, yeah. um, fishing. And then the last chapter is called The Deep End of the Pool. And, and that's about hunting. And it begins with the acknowledgement that this isn't for everybody. But if it is, here's some shit to keep in mind, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes perfect so I, sense. I like, I, I like it very much attacked it in a systematic way like that, which I wouldn't have done when I was younger. I would have done something weirder, wound up with the same thing, but would have taken a cockeyed route to get there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I can only imagine. I mean, there's so many different opportunities out there. And especially when you're working on something that long, like keeping your thoughts consolidated, like it, and just focused is, it makes sense. Um, there's this quote. Doing, Oh, uh, just real quick. There's this, I can't. I, I should look up who says this quote, but they're talking about writing a book, and they said it's like driving at night. Um, you only can see as far as your headlights. Yeah. Right. You keep going, 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 and eventually you get somewhere. <laughs> That's what it feels like, right? Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And I can, I can imagine. I mean, with that, was there anything that, you know, going through this process that surprised you, that you took away that you didn't expect to take away from it or something you learned from it or 
something that was shocking. Yeah. Um, you know what it was is like, I, 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 it forced me to realize the sort of richness of anecdotes that I've lived with my kids where everything I was talking about, I'd be like, okay, like what? And I'd be like, Oh yeah. It was that one time? You know what I mean? And it may be sort of like recollect that it's like, like any point I, I thought valuable to make about kids and nature, I would only need to think for a second and I would find right in my sort of like repertoire of stuff in my head, I would find like anecdotes and you realize like kind of like the richest of experience Yeah, you have over the years, you know, where you could like fill in all these, all these things. But a lot of times the way, the way I'm working on things is I'll, uh, I'll know I want to talk about something, you know, I know I want to write about it and, and I, I don't know where it'll fit, but I know it'll fit somewhere and, and I'll kind of work that way. Right. So a lot of times I'll be like, writing about something and then I'll realize I have a, a story that to help it but probably more often I already know there's a thing and I know that it means something and I'm going to find a place to put it where it's not out of place yeah story but that was that was one of the surprising things is just in these 12 years or as I was writing whatever 10 11 years um man it's like how many adventures we had in unexpected places yeah yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, it's really cool to think about when you have that much time to kind of script this together. Mm -hmm. um, just real quick, an update for everyone, make sure to throw any questions in the Q&A tab. Um, and then also make sure to take a look at that promo code that's out there. We're going to get to questions here pretty quick. So make sure to throw them in, they're going to be sending them our way. You know, and I, Steve, looking at it, like I was going through the questions, there was hundreds of different questions and there was a lot of key themes and obviously like technology that is a big one there's like you know a lot of folks were talking about their kids and just how do you and just how to solve the problem of like you know kids like to mess on phones they like to play video games screen time within that like how do you balance that because it is something that it's everywhere screens are everywhere we're yeah. all on screens right now how do you, you know, what's your, how did you, what's your perspective on that, on how to balance it for sure. trying? When well, it'd be like, I pointed this out before, it'd be pretty damn ironic for me to, to act like I'm, uh, for me to take an anti-technology, anti-media perspective, raising my kids when I, when I work in the digital media space, right? Um, it's no secret to our kids that we, in large measure, make our living working on computers and messing with phones and producing podcasts, which are listened to largely on mobile devices. So it's like, it'd be pretty rich for us to, to, to like outright condemn that stuff. Um, I would love to tell you something other than this was true, but we argue there's some discussion in my house every day about how much of that is appropriate every day. Right. Uh, but we like set some pretty hard and fast rules about it and it's not a free for all, but it doesn't come without a level of strife. What we do though. And I find again and again, parents come and say like, my kids don't want to go fishing. They don't want to go hunting. They don't want to go do X, Y, Z. And they're too distracted by things. We don't ask even with our 12 year old, we don't act like, I don't make it a habit to ask what he wants. Um, I don't see that as my, like, I don't see that, that I have that obligation at this point. That'll come in years, in, in future years, that'll become a thing. But at this age and younger, we don't ask, we, we tell them what's going on. Right. And so last weekend we went camping um, as we do quite often. And we didn't ask everybody if they wanted to go. And, and I know that like more than half the time, there'll be some amount of like kicking and screaming about a thing that was going to happen with their friends. They invited to do this. There's going to be a sleepover, whatever, birthday party. I don't know, something. But we never come home with regret that we had gone. Yeah. And you think that they would learn that lesson over time, right? That they would be like, you know what? My mom and dad, they always make us go do stuff, but we always have a good time. They don't. It's like, you got to have the fresh argument every single time. Like 
you know they're going to like it. You know they're going to learn stuff. You know they're going to have a great adventure. They don't. And I, like, metaphorically pull them by the ear. Yeah. And go and do it. So it's like, I don't view it as what, I don't care what they want all the time. Yeah. And and they know I don't care. So I'm not hiding this from them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tell them I don't care. Yeah. No, absolutely. And there was, you know, there was quite a few questions talking about that. We had folks writing in saying like, my kids are super motivated to get going right away, but then they may lose interest throughout. And after the yeah. first one, you know, they don't have as much gusto to keep going. Do you have any tips to keep them engaged and, you know, kind of how you work around those problems? Yeah, man, I got tips that are like, I got a lot of tips. Some of them are just really small, easy things. And some of them are more psychological. We do this thing. We do this thing with our kids on Halloween. Uh, when they were little, they thought it was real. Now they know, but it's not real. But we just still keep it going called the switch, Witch, right? So they'll read all kinds of candy trick or treating and we'll just take it from them. And we'll tell them that you're going to get a present in exchange for all your candy. <laughs> and we confiscate it. And I'll just go put it like in a bag in the truck. And later they're never like, man, that looks a lot like my Halloween candy. You know, it just doesn't click or used to not yeah. click. <laughs> so, and a lot of times, dude, I'm not kidding you, man. Like I want to get somewhere. I want to go do something. Right. I'll be like, when we hit the one mile mark at the one mile mark, no sooner the one mile mark, we will have a piece of candy. You pick out of this bag what you want. Stuff like that, like completely manipulative, you know, that. And also just a certain amount of cajoling, a certain amount of making them, a certain amount of like watching, they're, they're, they're not doing well, carrying them, reading the situation, stopping, having some water, letting them all go swim, cajole them some more to get moving, right? We got this place where we are, we have this little parcel where we camp a lot it abuts some national forest. And, and dude, I don't know how many times we've taken a walk down there there's a certain point we cannot get past like <laughs> some thing. So yeah. there's this one hill. I'm like someday, if I can know it's on top of that hill with these guys, but it's like, <laughs> no matter what, like, so I'm sort of watching like when we'll get past it. But I mean, honestly, for us, like a big hike, a big hike for us, we go a couple miles down the trail. Yeah. And back. And that's with a seven year old. That's a big hike. Yeah. Um, if I asked them one to turn around, it would be a 300 yard hike. Yeah. For sure. Because they'd get to the first creek crossing, we'd never go anywhere. Yeah. Which is like another thing I'll point out. It's like, that's a delicate issue with kids is um, not squishing their like curiosity, right? So they come to a creek and they want to play. And it's like, well, this should be great, right? But you also want them, but you also want to like have them see the result of labor. Yeah. You know, and so you're, you're always, you're making these little judgment calls all the time, man. But I lean toward being a little bit abusive in terms of what I'm asking them to put up with. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that makes sense. You know, and you said one thing, like you were talking about the candy and like having that as like an incentive to get going. Another big question that came in is like, you do all sorts of outdoor trips, hunting, fishing, camping, you know, that you'll do for the show or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. How does your gear differ for when you're going with your family or your kids? Are you bringing extra things? Like obviously you mentioned the candy, but are oh, there yeah. other emergency type things or just, you know, candy or t those types of things that you're bringing to make it go easier and just being careful when you're out there? Yeah, it's easier for me to, in terms of personal gear, I'm more inspired to bring personal gear that I know you should have, but I might be lazy and not grab it. First aid kit, basic survival kit, in reach device. Um, bear spray we just got a big argument last week i mean my wife said to bring our bear spray bear spray uh right i always bring a much bigger backpack because no matter i wind up carrying everything yeah. um so i bring a bigger back I'm, I'm blown away by how much water and how off how much water they need and how often they get thirsty like it doesn't make sense wet wipes we were joking with my wife earlier today and talking about this my wife's like you should just assume someone will shit their pants it's like <laughs> But one thing I don't bring is underwear, but that'd be pretty smart to bring. Yeah. Um, a lot of wet wipes, socks, clothes, just everything, man. We load up. And then um, cool kind of snack stuff, you know? Like, even if you go on a hike, like, you don't need to go that far. It doesn't need to be justified. But, like, have a little freeze dry in a camp stove and just kind of introduce them to, like, how stuff goes, right? Yeah. I just bring, 
I, I overpack. We, we fill a backpack up with stuff because it's just a lot more needs come up. And I'll sort of put, I'll, I'll sort of like, I don't know, I want to say pride myself, but, you know, I like to go like quite a while without water. You know, I don't want to start drinking water right away. Yeah, for um, sure. But you, you know, that doesn't work with little ones. So just carrying more stuff because the thing that I used to find right when we were starting out is you're always turning back and not doing what you want to be doing because of some issue you encounter around food, drink, bathroom. And, and I don't like, I don't like to surrender, you know, it's just better to have the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I know like even when I was growing up, I always looked forward to lunch. Like I knew it was going to be something really good that I probably didn't get just on mm -hmm. a new basis. So it was always that little bit of energy boost that I needed or morale boost just to keep it going mostly probably so my dad could hunt longer but sure thermos is a hot chocolate dude yeah it's it's invaluable yeah no it was i know it was big when i was growing up um all right jumping into some of the questions one that we've got you know quite a bit you talked about like your first two kids were born in new york and then seattle like any advice for those folks in big cities yeah you got to recalibrate what well, I guess it depends on what kind of experience you had as a kid, but let's, let's assume you're in a situation similar to what we were, where, uh, had a, had a, had a great nature filled upbringing and then found yourself through work, love, whatever, found yourself in an environment that wasn't like when you sat back and imagined having kids here, you are, it's happening in a place where it wasn't supposed to. Um, and you carry with you, an idea of what like a legitimate wilderness experience should look like. You need to get out of your own way and realize that, that their level of excitement is going to be a reflection of yours. Right. Yeah. I get excited about seeing new birds in our yard. <laughs> My kids get excited about seeing new birds in our yard. Why is that? Well, it's because I've demonstrated enthusiasm for that. So if you can find it in yourself, even if you're like, man, we should be living in a cabin in Alaska. And here we are stuck in Tennessee and Nashville, you know, whatever. Uh, you need to go to the park, go to the local fishing hole, go to the stock trout pond, whatever it is. You need to go there and, and be excited. If you go there and you're slumming it, they'll know they're slumming it. Yeah. And we found a lot of good times when our kids were little, like flipping rocks and flipping and rolling rotten stumps over. And under rocks, I don't care where you go, you flip a rock that's been sitting there a while, there's something under there. Yeah. And like roly polies, whatever. And like get over the idea or just never introduce them to it in the first place. Get over the idea that there's anything gross in nature. Yeah. Like if it's not going to bite you bad, put it in your hand. Yeah. And then you start, you're like laying the groundwork, right? And then later when you get to those real adventures that you wanted to go to, you've said like a groundwork. You said like nothing's icky. They can kind of handle dirt. They can handle discomfort. When it rains, it's not like the world's ending. Yeah. Right? And you're just, you're getting them ready because even if you lived in some crazy backwoods place when they're one, it's like, what are you really going to do anyways when they're one? Yeah. You're probably going to be out in the yard. You know, you're not going to be 10 miles back in the mountains with a yeah. one-year-old. I mean, you could, but it's, it's implausible. Yeah. So just be realistic. Like, and the other thing I would say in that environment is don't accept no. Just set your mind that you're going to do stuff and do it and don't back out because of weather. Don't back out because it didn't take their nap. Just make up your mind and go do it. Yeah. No, and that's great because there was quite a few questions of like, how do you, how do you push your kids past uncomfortable situations that mm -hmm. be uncomfortable at this moment, but you know, as they get a little bit older, they won't be anything or maybe the next trip, it won't be anything. And so, yeah, no, that's great. That's great insight there because I know we had quite a few folks asking that and just like, how do you find that balance of the good days versus the bad days? And, sure. You know, getting that across. Um, looking at, you know, some of the next ones, another big theme was, getting uh folks asking about getting your you know daughters in the outdoors and from your perspective do you differ in your approach or do you just take the same approach across the board from sons to daughters i probably do but in theory i don't um when we found out we were having a girl our girl's in the middle 
when we found out we were having a daughter, my wife, like, I'm not kidding you, man. My wife's not a hunter, you know. One of the first things she said, she's like, you don't treat her different than the boy. Yeah. In terms of the outdoors. It, it's funny, like, why would one need to say that? Well, one would need to say that because, you know, I got a friend that's worked on demographics, hunting demographics in America. Um, well, first off, it's, it's no secret that only, you know, of licensed hunters is only 10% are female, right, in the U.S., around there. Uh, yeah. Historically, like you go back a generation, if a woman hunted, not always, but speaking generally, if a woman hunted, it was like they were the firstborn. Yeah. Right? Or they had no brothers. So it, you almost imagine these like dads of years ago would be like, well, I never had a boy. I guess I'll have to take my daughter, you know? Um, and that was the thing. Even in my own family, like in my own family where I grew up, there was not one guy and all and just like the extended network. There was not one guy who didn't do some hunting and had taken hunter safety and all that. Not one woman in my extended family as a kid had ever taken hunter safety really not one that is not i mean i'm there are there are like you could take certain amounts of physiology and, and all this and, and account for some discrepancy but yeah. it's not that there's yeah. like a big social overlay there that's going on um i'm sensitive to it now having a daughter but like uh my daughter's nine, you know, she's very interested in hunting, very excited to go deer hunting. She's gotten a couple turkeys. Um, but I, but I, yeah, I probably do. Like I'm, I'm probably, I probably have a bias toward like, being a little nicer. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, jumping in, like, that's a good segue here. Lots of questions about hunting and just like when, what age, you know, son or daughter did you start getting them around hunting and yeah we'll start there what age did you really start like the concept of hunting and like yep. along on the first trip i've always they've always been exposed to it they've always been around ever since they were li real little they'd spent some amount of time out you know maybe in like sitting in the duck blind or whatever and even when my boy was real little i guess it's technically illegal he would bring his little red rider bb gun duck hunt i mean no one's really going to care right but he'd be yeah shooting away at ducks and he'd be like oh you got that one you know like well, since he was little man yeah um fishing all the time but with hunting like it in the state where i live in montana they gotta be 10 okay yep but we have all kinds of non-game so here like a cottontail rabbit is, is non-game red squirrels or pine squirrels are non-game so i don't know when my daughter killed her like shot her first pine squirrel the 22 she must have been five or six i don't know not very old yeah um so they do that but when it came to deer and turkeys um you can't hunt turkeys here to your tent but when my daughter was eight i took her and my boy to my buddy's place in wisconsin for youth turkey season because they had no age requirement she shot a turkey when she was eight i don't think that it was too early but i think a year earlier would have been too early for her and there's a couple of reasons i bring that up it's just like the ability to handle a firearm okay yeah and that's going to vary with size and stuff right like now you can like federal makes this uh tss shot you can take like nine shot tss and run it through a 410 and level turkeys with it for sure 20 30 yards you level turkeys with a 410 yeah. she's killed both the turkeys with a 410 and a red dot but yeah. You know, it takes a little assistance. Um, my boy, he killed his first big game man when he was 10. It was great, man. That was a great age. You could do it earlier. When I see people, and I'm not condemning, I'm just talking like, this is the thing, like, in, in my mind, I don't think this is like a state issue, really. I think that most states should do what Michigan and Wisconsin do. It's up to the family. Yeah. If they're mentored, right? So if you're within arm's reach, I don't feel personally, I don't feel there should be any restrictions. If a kid is within arm's reach of their parent, or a guardian who's 21 years old or whatever and licensed, that's a family choice. Yeah, so when yeah. I say that I see something I don't like, I don't mean I don't think they should be able to do it. I just know that it wouldn't be right for me. If I see kids that they're five and they've gotten a deer, I just wonder, you know, how well do they understand what happened? Yeah. Nothing yeah. bad's going to happen to them, but I just wonder like, how well are they comprehending it? You know? And I wonder too, like what the experience would be like when they get down the road. 
for at 10 years old, um, I have no regrets about having that 10 year big game hunting at 10. It yeah, was wow. perfect. It was perfect. So when I was, when I was growing up in Michigan at the time, they dropped it. Now you had to be 14 to hunt deer with a gun. No one waited that long, but legally you had to be 14 to hunt deer with a gun. Looking back, that was ridiculous. Yeah. That's four years, five years too late. Yeah. Yeah. And I, everybody I, I, felt that way and no one paid, like in my circle, no one paid attention to that rule, man. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't imagine wait till I'm 14. I mean, you know, Montana's 10 now. I grew up in Montana. It was 12. And man, mm -hmm. I, you would ask me, I was ready when I was seven or eight. Who knows if I actually sure. was. Because every yeah, kid's different, man. Yeah. Every kid's different. Yeah. And the idea of waiting till 14, like, you know, I started going along on trips. Like that would have been an eternity. It would have been so long. You might miss your chance even. Yeah. Yeah, you know exactly. what I mean? Like you might miss your chance for that ideal opportunity to expose them to it because they got to spend too many years watching their old man do it. Yeah. Or exactly. their mom, or, you know, I don't mean to say that, but like watching their guardian, whatever the hell it is. And they're like, man, this is your thing. It's not my thing. Yeah. Like I can't do it, you know? Yeah. Which then, you know, and this is another good segue of if you did wait till 14, that's when organized sports clubs, stuff like that goes on. You know, one question we had, and I know you talked about it on the podcast, but the idea of outdoor activities versus organized sports or clubs and kind of your perspective on that. Can you uh, dive yeah, into yeah. that a little bit? Yeah, you know where I'm at on this. This is like, you're, you're getting into an issue that causes me like marital problems. Listen, <laughs> uh, I don't like... I don't have any enthusiasm for organized sports and I never did. I'm just going to be like flat out. Like me personally never was into it. I like to take my kids to do stuff. I like to do for a handful of reasons. One of those reasons is I'm enthusiastic about it. And I have expertise on it, a level of expertise about it. Why not? Like the same way as if I was a lifelong golfer and I had a wonderful time on the golf course and I knew a fair bit about golfing and my friends all golfed, it makes sense that I would, to demonstrate to my kids, like the world I love and a world I knew that they could find enrichment, yeah. we'd be down at the golf course all the time. But yeah, it's like, yeah. that's not my scene. So I, I kind of re like rebel against this idea where you have these sort of like peer pressures to get into things like to get into football, which me nor, nor my wife, like we don't follow it, yeah. right? We have other stuff. And so I don't want to get into a situation. And this happened to me one time when my boy did T-ball. And he's little. I don't know, he's real little. Yeah. Nine Saturdays in a row. In the summer. <laughs> spring and summer. Yeah. I am no longer. I made that mistake once. I am no longer willing to tell someone that nine Saturdays in a row, we're going to be that the Ranella family is going to be down at some park. Yeah. Because I, I would hope that seven of them were out picking mushrooms or camping or visiting fishing off grandma's dock i don't know like it's just like not what i want to do and i and so uh this isn't advice to anybody but like i want my kids to see to be with me in an environment where i'm engaged and have something to bring to the table yeah. just as i would expect any other parent to do the same yeah no absolutely it's uh there's so many good things out there to do and yeah those types of things takes up quite a bit of time that mm -hmm. you can be out doing things in the outdoors, camping, hunting, fishing, whatever it may be. So it's always a trade off there for sure. My kid did shoot archery league this winter though. Oh, nice. But that, I, but I said, is it, is it weekdays? It was Wednesday nights. I said, you go for it if it's Wednesday nights. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, okay. that's perfect. With that, you know, especially with archery, there's a lot of questions on, poundage of bows and calibers of rifles when mm -hmm. your kid started what what was your approach there yeah so like i said with my little daughter um she's small framed tall but like real cable-y yeah uh shoots at 410 yep um and that's great with a red dot on it and you know here's here's another little thing to keep in mind in practicing she's never shot turkey load Oh yeah. We practice with light target loads. Then I'll take it and make sure it's zeroed with turkey load. And she doesn't know. Like when she's the two times she shot at turkeys with that 
heavy duty turkey load doesn't even register. Yep. But if you yep. made her practice with that, she'd get gunshot, right? So, but then with my kid, big game hunt, we use this. Um, I had a 243 I was planning on him using, but then he's been shooting a 6.5 Creedmoor and doing real well with that. <laughs> um, I'll probably, like, I got my, my younger boys left handed and I'm left handed. So I'm hanging on to a couple lefty guns. I got a lefty 243 I might have him use for deer. Yeah. Um, we take that approach with poundage. My 12 year old's not hunting. Uh, archery hunting for deer yet though he very much wants to and i'm I, I use it as like a i use it as a negotiating point i'm like you need to spend more time shooting you yeah need to develop better proficiency and i had a poundage limit set for him i can't remember what the hell it was i think i told him he's already close i told him like 40 pounds like get to 40 pounds but you got to spend more time shooting man and they, when they shoot they want to do like hail marys and they were out oh, shooting one day and sunk an arrow into the neighbor's garage you know like they're not disciplined about practice. They're just like seeing how far the arrow will go. And, yeah. and so I use hunting as like, that's what I'm going to use to get him in the next year or so. I'm going to use, I'm going to withhold that privilege from him in order to get what I want out of him, which is yeah. discipline. Yeah. No. And that, that actually goes right into the next question, which was the things, you know, to do to prepare them, whether it's shooting their bow rifle but then also from like a physical fitness standpoint like you're talking mm. about taking them hiking and trying to get them over that hill what types of aspects do you do there is it just more frequency or are there certain things that you do that you know will benefit them when they're outside but maybe at the time it's more preparation or an investment so they're more prepared when it comes time to being out there yeah the only thing i've done like that so far um is because we're not doing sports and because remember I said like it causes like me certain like marital issues right because I'm like so sure. adamant about this whole thing yeah. um that my older boy now and only just started to write just re last five six months or whatever he's learning how to do um then we're being regimented about it like a couple times a couple times a week 30 minutes of just like traditional like like floor exercises push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, right? Like in, in a disciplined way um, to make up for the fact that we're, that, that he's not doing other stuff. Um, and in mine, and I motivate him on that, like he really wants to be a spear fisherman. Like he likes spear fishing. He wants to be a big game hunter. That in his mind, the calculus is like, it, it, it really is like, he's imagining. I'm sure there's other like pure issues that are coming up, I'm sure in time, like he'll just become more aware of himself physically. Yeah. But right now he's motivated by like, if you're going to be a spear fisherman, you need to same with swimming. Um, they swim in the winter, yeah. uh, weeknights in the winter. And like, he's like, he, he runs it in his head. I'm like, if you're going to be a spear fisherman, you got to learn to swim strong. And that makes him want to go swim. Right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense for sure. Um, real quick, just an update for everyone. Make sure, you know, obviously check out the book. There is a discount if you look in the chat. It'll be posted in there. Go to the website, use code Outdoor Kids. You'll get a percentage off all books and apparel on the Mediator website. And then, you know, keep throwing your questions in. We got about 20 minutes left. So we got a, a slew of questions here. I'm trying to go through quick. But, you know, looking at the next one, um, one that's come up a couple of times is did you ever experience and how did you address like your kids having difficulty when they saw their first animal when they shot their first animal or just death in general there was one individual who talked about like their son loves to fish but he doesn't like to actually touch the fish and mm -hmm. the act of actually eating the fish that connection was very difficult for them how did you approach that man i, I you know I only have my own experiences to go on and I can't really tell that this is like absolutely the right way, but it was uncensored from day one. And it, it was never shocking to him. It was never shocking to him because they'd always been around it. The one time I shielded them from something, um, a friend of mine had raised some lambs and he had to like, you know, we were going out to shoot and skin the lambs. And I distracted my kids off somewhere. And then later I wonder if I even, if that was even a mistake, but they've never been, I've never hidden anything from them. So since they can comprehend like their earliest memory, they'd already been exposed to it all. And now nothing grosses them out. I mean, nothing. My daughter hates spiders. Other than that, nothing grosses them out, man. I could take a 
the, the gut pile out of a squirrel and put it in their hand and they wouldn't flinch. Yeah. He's just like, they've never know they've never not known that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. There's Is no there surprise. Any... There's, there's like no like moment of discovery because it's always been around. Yeah. And that was like strategic. Like I, I just knew that I was like, I don't want to deal with that later on. We're just gonna get it all out of the way before they even know what's going on. Yeah. For your kids, is there anything, is there an activity they gravitate towards more? Mm, yeah, it's funny that, yeah, they all have their, it's like, they all come from, you know, our kids at least, not all, but our kids come from the same two parents, grew up in the same family, but they're just different, you know? Yeah. My older one loves to, loves to shoot, right? He likes shooting all the time, man. BB guns, airsoft guns, 22s, loves to shoot. Uh, my daughter is a walking, hiking maniac. <laughs> exploring hiking walking like if i could take those two and combine them i'd have like a, the ultimate predator yeah you know what i mean yeah. she just motors and yep. she for whatever reason really likes to like find antlers right and that in her mind is super cool and they're yeah. when like care less so it's just yeah. funny like you, you you feel like you're doing all these things the same it's this whole thing like nurture nature right like yep. you feel like you're doing like this sort of like facsimile of experiences but no matter what, it spits out different results. Yeah. You know? And my younger one, I, I don't really know. Like he, he's so tuned into his siblings that I don't have as much sway over him because he's very tracking what his brother, older brother and sister are doing. And I'm corn, I'm like an afterthought. Whereas my first kid was intensely focused on me. Yeah. You know, and so he's having a different experience, right? Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, has there ever been a situation where you know, camping, hunting, whatever, where maybe you, you know, you felt like, okay, maybe I, I exposed them to too much, too quick or something like that. There's a lot of questions mm. about fear of, you know, ruining it before they even have a chance to experience it. Yeah. I think that, you know, we have a little fish shack in Southeast Alaska and, and I used to worry about making them go out in the boat for, you know, eight, 10 hours fishing at jig and halibut, you know, um, and they'd be bored out of their minds, man. Like, where are we fighting? They're bored. They're fighting each other. But it's funny. We do all that. And I always remember, like, just last summer, like, I'm just making them out all day out of the boat. I'm like, man, they're never going to want to go near the water again. And my daughter goes to school, and she's got to write her favorite. Like, she's got to, like, draw a picture and tell a story about her favorite thing that summer. Guess what it was? Sitting in the halibut boat. I'm <laughs> like, I can't believe you thought that was. Like, you had the worst time of, of your life in that halibut boat. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. That's the fun that you don't realize is fun until after. Dude, I know it sticks with them in a funny way, man. But I think what they do realize is they're like, man, some people will go fish for a long time. You know, right? And that's a good lesson. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I told my I told my boy last summer, uh, I said, you know what? You gotta learn. There will always be someone around you who doesn't want to fish as much as you do. <laughs> always there's always you get that in everything there's always someone that's a little bit better more desire whatever it is yeah. um another big question that's coming up is you know of all the benefits of just kids experiencing the outdoors how do you feel that affects them and other aspects of their life or what are some key themes of how it's positively impacting them in other aspects of their lives yeah, that's a solid one, man. And um, I can take a couple different approaches on it. One, uh, it's speculative, right? Like, I'll really be equipped to answer that in 40 years a lot better than I'm, if I'm, you know, I'll be dead, but right, I'd be better equipped to answer that in 40 years. Maybe I'll maybe be alive, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it'll be borderline. Um, there's a couple ways of looking at it, though. My conservation heroes okay like like these, these people we look at in american history who are just like extraordinarily impactful in the areas of of, of hunter-based conservation fisherman-based conservation were people that had a really intimate relationship with nature when they were young okay yeah there's like a common theme there right like like Roosevelt was just drawn to the outdoors, right? Despite yeah. all this, like, like overbearing mother and being not well as a kid, like he was drawn to it. Leopold drawn to it, right? So you have this history of people who are engaged. So you look at me like, um, in, in terms of my kids, like way down the road, like playing a long game. Yeah. Um, I think it's like a much higher likelihood that they would find in themselves the inspiration to be environmental stewards conservationist habitat you know 
to have be involved in habitat conservation if they have a love for that stuff. Yeah, that just to me seems like that to me seems obvious. On a, on a personal level, I think that there's a toughness that comes. There's a there's a resiliency. There's a sense of self sufficiency. There's a knowledge that whether you use it or not, there's knowledge that like like to go out to have the wherewithal. So so that my nine year old daughter has the wherewithal to shoot a turkey, gut the turkey, help clean the turkey, participate in cooking the turkey. Her family then eats the turkey. Yeah. Right. You have just there, like you accomplished a hell of a lot there in terms of self-sufficiency and like understanding the processes that go in to keeping you alive. Now, if you ask my daughter right now where she's going to live, it changes by the day, but she might tell you she's going to go to Los Angeles. Like she likes the palm trees and stuff. She's going to yep. go live in LA and whatever the hell. Yeah. Be a detective. Maybe when she's 22, she'll live in a big city. She'll never hunt again. God bless her. Like, I'm not going to be mad. Yeah. However, she'll do that as someone that knows that they can kill a turkey and cook it and clean it. And like that sort of set of experiences, no matter what you're going to go do later on, sets up certain things about your comprehension of yourself and what you're capable of. That's my operating thesis. Yeah. Right? And, and I have a lot of little things that I think are good where I know that they respect, like they respect wild animals. They respect nature. Yeah. I know that that's true. Yeah, for sure. So I've created that. Where it goes, I don't know. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great. Um, you know, I'm looking at it. These There's a couple of other questions just kind of playing off. Like once you have your kids and like they obviously understand the benefits and they're super motivated to go out. Um, one question that comes up is your stance on taking them out of school or events or other obligations to go on these trips. Man, most people have heard this quote. I, I live by uh, Mark Twain said, I never let schooling get in the way of my education. And I just, I don't, our old man took us out of school so much. It's nuts, man. Uh, <laughs> I one time got, we used to have this thing called in-school suspension. I had yeah. in-school suspension for missing school. And my dad called school and pulled me out of in-school suspension to go help him track a deer. Yeah. So it's like, uh, I don't care. Maybe later when grades start to matter a whole bunch, I will. But right now, like, I, I just don't, I don't care. I'll, I'd pull them out for any reason whatsoever. I mean, like my wife and I have like slightly, like slightly different opinions about it. She's totally cool about it. She'd have them go a little more. I would view it more like, like rather than be like, today would be a good day for them not to go. I almost wind up thinking like, hey, today would be a good day to go to school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I can just, you know, anecdotally i know the dates that i knew i was getting pulled out of school to go on a trip that was christmas like that i was so excited for that yeah. so, but obviously when you're younger it's like yeah do i get to go out and go hunting or camping fishing or go to school like that was a pretty easy decision there but it those are the ones i look at very fondly because they were more extended and it was a bigger trip and like i can remember back to the moment i knew i was gonna miss not saying miss all the time but yeah, it we was. never had to go. October 1 was the opener bow. We didn't have to go Yeah. To school. November 15 was the opener rifle, and you didn't have to go to school. But on the opener of squirrel season, which was September 15th, for whatever reason, you had to go half the day. <laughs> that, was the family, <laughs> that was the family rule. <laughs> yeah. Um, playing off that, you know, there's quite a few questions of what was there an impactful thing from your childhood that you always look back on fondly that you either tried to recreate for your kids or it's something that really stuck with you when you're looking for activities that you're going to take them out to do. Mm, I'm going to kind of do the same thing, but the opposite. Uh, I had a lot of great opportunities. We had a lot of adventures. My dad taught us a lot of stuff, man. We did not get along good later. And he would say, he would say, you know, like, it's not my job to be your friend. I'm not here to be your friend. Um, that caused a lot of friction, man. Like yeah. we had a lot of, like he taught us a lot, but I just feel like, like, um, I, I, like I can't really get in his head on it. You know, I don't, uh, I respect what he came from. I respect what he went through and, and he had a lot of trials and tribulations early on in his life and it made him what it is. I have tried to correct 
I've tried to keep the, the core essence of this. Like we were all, as a kid, I was always welcome to go with him hunting and fishing. He would never leave you behind if you wanted to go. Yeah. Um, and I, and I try to like do that with my kids, but I try to do it in a way where like, just open up a little more room for like a, like a relationship rather than just teacher pupil, like yeah. a little more room for there to be like a, like an element of friendship in this whole outdoor experience that matters to me a lot but then i i say that but like in little details you know um cooking meals over fires you know like like all these cool things we did right like i try to do that too but i try to keep in mind like how to keep the essence of what i the best parts of what i got from my parents and improve on the things that i recognize were the worst parts of what i got from my folks yeah yeah no that makes perfect sense um just doing a quick time check. We've got about seven minutes. I'm going to get through a couple more questions. I'm going to shift a little bit. We've been talking from the perspective of you raising your kids and how to set them up for success. We actually have quite a few kids on here who are asking questions. And one kind of common theme is, you know, they're very passionate about being outdoors, but it's difficult because they may not, they're trying to get either their friends or their parents, you know, to mm -hmm. join. Any, any advice there? man that just hasn't been my experience right like like um that hasn't been but i do see my i i do see uh i do see it with my own kid and it's funny because he he's got a lot of you know my older boy's got a lot of friends at school but he's got a lot of like i'm shocked at how many friends he has that they share that love of hunting and fishing yeah you know and they kind of sniff each other out in some weird way <laughs> I used to always say like if I go to a wedding like in five minutes I like found the one guy that hunts at the wedding you know we like yeah. talk all night right and so I think like really going out of your way to find those like-minded people but in terms of advice I'd be lying if I said I had advice for a kid who wanted to be outdoors or wanted to get into hunting and their parents didn't I'd have to think about that for a couple of days because I, I just I don't have it right yeah yeah no that's a that's definitely a tough one there um Another one is, you know, like going back to your perspective and raising your kids in these situations when they're out hunting and fishing, there's a lot of stuff about like patience and how mm -hmm. you address patience. You know, the example here is fly fishing and getting line tangled, which is oh, yeah. for anyone. It's not fun for either party. How do you go about, you know, kind of addressing that situation and just keeping the spirits high while you're out Yo, there? I push pretty hard. I push pretty hard towards success. You can, you remember earlier I was talking about like your kids come to a creek, you're trying to do a hike, right? And your yep. kids come to a creek and they want to play in the creek. And then how, like, you know, you should be glad that your kids want to play in the creek. That's wonderful. But you also want to know like, what it's like to walk, hike a couple miles. With, with, with stuff like that, with like fishing, I'll push pretty heavy. I'll, I'll like explore the edge of too much in, actually fishing okay yeah because because i want them to see the ways in which discipline and expertise yield success yeah right and if you just go down and it's like they like to play with bait i don't know why like they like bait better than what you're catching yeah if you just went down to the beach surf casting and you just play with the minnows or you just go and throw all the you know watch fish bluegills come up and eat the worms and you're never actually fishing like they're gonna have a good time but i need them i want them to see like what happens when you play it out so i recognize the conflict um and i push like i said borderline too hard toward being like we're here to do a thing yeah we're here to sit in this blind and we're going to shut up and we're going to try to shoot a deer yeah because i want you to see how that goes and if I listen to you and we just play, make noise and throw snowballs, um, you're never going to see like what the culmination of, of all this preparation. So I, I try to focus like them experiencing, getting close to an experiencing success to see that that feels even better than all the distractions. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. You know, and I know we're we're pretty much at time. So kind of the last question that comes up quite a bit, and you've touched on it many times, but throughout this whole process and one, writing the book, but then also just you raising your kids, 
what has been like, what have you learned and what's like the most rewarding thing that you've taken away from everything? Oh man, just today, uh, by, by two kids, two older ones were real excited about a bird they'd found in a spotting scope on the neighbor's roof. Yeah. So like, I was like, man, how cool. Like they went and got the spotting scope, set it up, put it on the bird. They'd mis ID'd it. It was a Northern <laughs> flicker. They thought it was some kind of fly catcher, but they had looked it up in the book. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't take enough time just to like, I don't often enough, like look and be like, that's great. Right. I'm always kind of looking at the next thing, but man, yeah, just today, man, like that experience is like, you know what? I don't care what they go and do. Like, yeah. I'll still love them and everything, but I was like, that's cool that I've, that, that, yeah. that in my way, I've helped inspire curiosity, learning, you know, like putting a s- scope on a tripod and getting it in on something, right? Like yeah. that they're, that they're engaged with the world around them. Yeah. They're excited about the world around them. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's cause for celebration. Like a bird on the neighbor's roof is cause for celebration. Yeah. And it's that self-reliance and sufficiency that you were talking about earlier. No, that's yeah. Great. And it's like, it's like, if they can learn to do that, they can apply that same like curiosity, inspiration, technical skill set to whatever else. Yeah. Professional. And then someday maybe to raising their own kids. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Steve, I appreciate it. And everyone that joined, thank you very much. Make sure to check out the book, Outdoor Kids and Inside World. Look in the email that you're going to receive. Also in this chat, use code Outdoor Kids at the Meat Eater and you'll get a discount, TheMeatEater.com, excuse me. You'll get a discount on the book and any apparel, Bear Grease hat, any of that stuff on there. And Steve, thanks for taking time this evening. I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. Take care, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining. Thanks, all.